I'm uh, Yuval Marcus. I work at uh, Commonwealth Crypto down the street. Um, I'm going to present my work on, uh, on Ethereum. And these are low resource eclipse attacks on their peer to peer network. And also, I'm a sophomore at the year. As a joint work with Ethan Hellman, who gave a talk uh, at Underscore VC two weeks ago, and Sharon Goldberg. All right, so first of all, it, so these first two slides might be a recap of what Ethan was talking about but, uh, two weeks ago, but why does the security of the peer to peer network really matter? So you have your blockchain consensus layer, and normally, Research looks at that, and if the blockchain is working, everything should be good. But underneath the blockchain, you have the peer-to-peer -peer network layer. So if you can find some vulnerabilities in the peer-to-peer -peer network layer, you can actually do some weird stuff on blockchain consensus. And the attack I'm presenting here is an eclipse attack, where you gain full control of a node's access to the information, i.e. the blockchain. And this is a low-resource eclipse attack. I'll explain why in the coming slides. First, just a review of uh, what a peer-to-peer -peer network looks like in a blockchain. All these circles are nodes. Let's imagine the purple one is the victim that we will attack. In normal, the normal workflow, you make some good outgoing connections and some incoming connections. And this is usually TCP uh, to share the blockchain information. And actually in Ethereum, they use UDP for doing the network discovery for querying for peers and um, yeah, connecting with them to, to add them in connections. Um, but it's TCP to share the blockchain information. Um, so let's say a node found a block. He shares it with his node, his nodes, and they share it with their nodes. And eventually, the block gets propagated throughout the network. Um, but in Eclipse Attack, the attacker will actually own all these connections, um, represented by the devil-looking node. So you can see here now that all his incoming connections are from the attacker, the victims, and all the outgoing connections are to the attacker. So what happens is he's eclipsed by the attacker, and when a node finds a block, he'll share it, but the attacker can choose not to give it to the victim. So he's choosing what information to share. Um, he the attacker shares a block with nodes that are not eclipsed because, I mean, it doesn't matter if you do or don't because they'll probably find it throughout you know, another node that they're talking to. And, yep. So this is what it looks like. The Eclipse attack attacker is in between the victim and the rest of the network, represented by this cloud. Uh, this, is, this is a big review, but uh, I will, uh, I'll do it quickly. Um, some implications of an Eclipse attack. The big one, the fact that you can do 51% attacks with less than 51%. 40% to be exact. So. Let me just explain. So imagine you're a miner with 40% and you're not doing the attack. Uh, normally, uh, and the rest of the network would have 60 if you have 40. Normally, uh, you're good. The 51% attack won't happen because you have less mining power than the honest nodes. But in Eclipse attack, what you're going to do is you're going to actually take and eclipse one big miner, this guy here who has 30%. And you're basically partitioning him from the rest of the network. And that actually cuts in half um, how much the honest nodes have. So normally they would have 60%, but this now you now he only has 30%, and the rest of the network has 30%, and the attacker has 40. So what happens is 40 is greater than 30, and what will happen is the blockchain for the attacker will always be longer than both the victim, who's on a partition network, so he's not even seeing what these guys are seeing, and it's always going to be longer than the rest of the network that you're not even Eclipse it. Um, and the reason why that's bad is that, well, 51% attacks are bad because, first of all, censorship. You, if, if the attacker is always winning the next block, um, you, can, you can include any transact, you get to pick the transactions you include. So you can actually just restrict a specific address from setting transactions. You can do, you don't even need to do that. You can actually just always keep winning. You'll always, because you get the next block, you always get the block reward. Uh, so that's unfair. And you can also do double spend attacks. But I'll show in the next slide how you can do a double spend attack with an Eclipse attack without having any mining power. And why there's a check on this one is because normally the way blockchain consensus works is you pick the longest chain that has the most work. So, yep. And implication two, which is really cool, you can do a double spend attack without any mining power. 
And in this example, I'm showing a three confirmation double spin attack, but the three is arbitrary. You could wait for as many blocks as you want. So let's see how this works. Imagine, uh, so it's a bit different. The attacker has no mining power here, but he's actually co-opting uh, the mining power of the purple node, who he's eclipsing. And we introduce Bob, who's a merchant, and the attacker has eclipsed him too. So really, Bob can only see the attacker nodes and the eclipsed miner. The way it works is the attacker just sends his coin to Bob. Um, and this is real coin. It's not like you're making like fake money. Um, you send that transact you broadcast that transaction to the eclipsed miner. You don't, you don't broadcast it to the rest of the network. You're broadcasting that to the network that you've created, the partition one. Um, the miner will see it. And it's like, oh, new transaction. He includes it in a block. Um, and again, in this case, we're going to wait for three confirmations. Bob sees three confirmations. He releases the car, thinking he now has Bitcoin. But at the same time, what the attacker does is he sends that same exact coin back to himself. And he broadcasts that transaction to you know, the one that has more power, the rest of the network that he's not eclipsing. So they're going to include it in their blockchain. And again, same thing will happen, where when the eclipse attacker leaves, this chain is longer than the chain that they were building. So this transaction that got sent to Bob never actually happened. So the attacker gets away with his car and his money again, hence the double spend. And also as a side effect, this miner just wasted processing power. He just built blocks and thought he was getting rewards, but he's not. Um, yeah, and feel free to ask any questions if that's confusing. Uh, but it was just a review of what Ethan was saying. Um, and some deeper analysis, some papers you can see. Um, this second one is actually really cool, where you can do, you can combine Eclipse attacks with selfish mining, but for another day. All right, uh, quickly, we're just gonna, uh, I have Bitcoin on the left and Ethereum on the right, if you forget how Bitcoin works. But uh, Bitcoin defaults to 125 TCP connections, Ethereum defaults to 25. Bitcoin does eight outgoing, Ethereum does 13. The key difference here is that the network is unstructured in Bitcoin, but in Ethereum, it's structured. It's actually based on the Kademlia protocol, which is just a fancy distributed hash table. It's used in BitTorrent, and it's also used in IPFS, a few other things too. Um, another key difference is that Bitcoin nodes are identified by their IP address, and Ethereum nodes are actually identified by just an ECDSA pub key. And I'll explain why that's important in a second. And Bitcoin connections are non encrypted slash authenticated. Ethereum connections are encrypted slash authenticated. Um, so this is what Ethan showed two weeks ago. And he was able to do Eclipse attacks by either being an ISP, where you have a lot of IP addresses, or doing a botnet attack. And the reason why he had to do that is because in Bitcoin, nodes are identified by their IP address. But in Ethereum, because nodes are identified by their ECDSA pub key, you can actually do the same Eclipse attacks, but with only two machines. And that's what we did in uh, 2018 in, this, in the paper when we released it. And that's important because it's very different. In this one, you have IP addresses are really scarce. You basically have to either be an ISP or ask you know, AWS for some IP addresses, but it costs a lot of money and they probably won't give you the number you need. But in Ethereum, you just have, what we did is we had one machine who, did, who monopolized all the outgoing connections of the victim and we had another machine in DigitalOcean that monopolized all the incoming connections. And, yep? Uh, I think six uh, addresses that are expensive. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, oh, yeah. Okay. You, usually you should not. And you might be able to get a few, but. Hmm. And, and also, actually, in Bitcoin, it's with distinct subnets. So it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit different. You have to get, I think, on the slash 16, not slash 24. So, yeah, they are, they are expensive. Um, and we probably could have done the Eclipse attack with one machine. It's just I was using my Mac, and my Mac is pretty slow. But yeah. So let's just, uh, before we look at Ethereum specifically, just a generic pattern. Uh, this is how it worked in Bitcoin, and also how it works in Ethereum. You're just manipulating, basically, the victim's connections to the attacker. So first, you have to just fill the nodes, peer tables, with attacker IDs. You make him restart, and I'll explain how you do that. You make him restart because you need him to lose his current outgoing connections. Then, when he reboots, he'll only connect to the attacker because you filled his peer tables. 
And then to finish the attack, you monopolize his incoming connections. And quickly, let's look at how, uh, how you can make a node restart. A couple of ways. Software and security updates. Uh, the victim has to restart, or there are going to be some unpatched and vulnerable things in his computer. There are some documented cases of uh, packet of death or denial of, denial of service attacks. And these are just special packets you send to a, a Bitcoin or Ethereum node, and the node will just crash. Um, or you can just wait for normal power or network failure. The main point is that security should not rely on 100% node uptime. Uh, so we understand how we're going to restart the node. How exactly do you fill the node's peer tables with attacker IDs? So let's look at Ethereum. Uh, in Ethereum, you have two peer tables, the database and a bucket table. The database is persistent storage. The bucket table is uh, reset actually every run the, uh, when the node starts up. And the important part is actually filling the bucket table because it's the bucket table that's used to create the outgoing connections. And these are the nodes that the, the Ethereum node asks for peers, for more neighbors to connect to. Um, so how do we do this? We basically just make unsolicited connections and add node IDs to his peer table. You just say, hey, I'm, a, I'm an attacker. Or you don't say you're an attacker. You're just a normal node. I'm a node. Take an ID. And what Ethereum does is if there's room in the bucket table, uh, you get added. Uh, here are more node IDs. Um, you also always get added to the database. It's not really important to fill the bucket table right now because you're actually going to reboot him. It's just important that the victim knows uh, the attackers. And the reason why is that, well, I'll explain, I'll explain in, in the next slide why that's important. But basically, a bit oversimplified, but you're just telling him, hey, take some node IDs. And this is really easy. Because node IDs are identified by ECD, ECDSA keys. You just, run the, you just run the algorithm, and you can just make as many attackers as you want. Uh, in fact, I created uh, 272 nodes. Uh, there were 16 for the first, uh, yeah, for 16 buckets. And yeah, did that in 10 minutes. So it's really low resource, unlike in Bitcoin, where you'd have to actually get I, different distinct IP addresses. OK, and node IDs, again, no, node IDs are only added after testing their online. So you can't just give you know, your IDs and not actually have them respond back. They're going to have to respond back to the victim until he actually adds them to the bucket tables. All right, the first vulnerability, very interesting. Uh, upon reboot, what would happen in Ethereum is that, well, we know the bucket table is empty. But what would happen is if one of these incoming connections from the attacker uh, gets in, this seeding process is skipped. So what is the seeding process? Um, at the beginning of the Ethereum node, you don't, your bucket table is empty. So you look at your persistent database, and you pick 30 random seed nodes, and you add them to the bucket table. And it's going to be hard for the attacker to control the database. Uh, so this vulnerability actually makes it really easy, because you just have to make one connection. Because what would happen is the Ethereum node's listener would be online before the seeding started. And the seeding would actually be skipped if one node exists in the bucket table. So basically, make the connections quickly, and you have a high probability where the seeding doesn't happen. And that's bad, because now the attacker really has no competition. On reboot, it's really, it's, he's really vulnerable to the victim. The bucket table is empty. He needs some really, good seed, some really good seed nodes from the database who are honest to make sure that there's not one attacker who could just fill all the bucket table, fill all the buckets in the bucket table. So that's one vulnerability. Uh, okay, how exactly do you get into the specific buckets? Um, what I'm going to show here is actually Kademlia. It's just a modified version of Kademlia. If you know how uh, those DH, the Kademlia DHD works, but basically, this is the node we're attacking, um, and imagine he's going to add this green node here. So what you do is you take a hash of the public key, and the hash is SHA-3 in Ethereum. And very simple, compare the number of bits that are the same. In this case, we have four bits that are the same. So that means we'll put the node in bucket four. And you also add it to the database. So why is this, why is this important? This brings us to the next vulnerability. This hash is public. So is the victim's own ID. So basically, the attacker can just keep on creating these node IDs 
because you know the victim's uh, new ID, and you can keep on making them uh, until you get the specific buckets that you want. And this is important because the probability of an honest node of landing in a specific bucket, bucket i, is actually 1 over 2 to the i. Why? Because the probability of landing in bucket 1 is 1 half, because a bit, a bit is only true or false, yes or no. So let's say you had the, let's say you had the first bit the same. So that, well, that was a 1 half chance. OK, am I going to land in bucket 2? Let me check the second bit, and that's another 1 half. And then so on and so on, 1 half, 1 half, 1 half. And you see it gets exponential. But for an attacker, uh, he can just keep on mining the node IDs. Of course, he can't get like bucket 255 because unless you had like some supercomputer. But it's okay because you don't need to fill those buckets. You only need to fill the first like 16 buckets is what we did in our attack. So the probability that an attacker will get in a specific bucket I is 100%. And that's different for Bitcoin because it's IP addresses. So this is a very big vulnerability in that you can just keep on running this, and you'll have a lot of attacker node IDs to use. Okay. Yeah. Very <laughs> silly system. Well, that's a, that's what I thought too. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, when we get to the countermeasures, we can see what they do. <laughs> um, and the second vulnerability, uh, these both help make it low resource, is that all node IDs in the bucket can have the same IP. Again, because nodes aren't identified by IP address, you can just run all these IDs from one IP. So you don't need to buy all these computers. You can just run it from, I, did, I just ran on my Mac. Um, and yeah, and you might be confused, like why do we need these vulnerabilities if we had vulnerability zero where no honest nodes would come? We're assuming, no honest nodes from the seeding, we're assuming that vulnerability zero has been fixed. These two still exist um, and, are, and make it really easy actually to get it. Um, okay, so let's put it together. The attacker first mines the attacker IDs. Uh, they're very specially crafted ones to get in all the buckets of the victim. He restarts. Oh, wait. Before he restarts, uh, you need to tell the victim about these nodes. Um, it doesn't matter if you don't get in the bucket table. You just have to exist in the victim's database. And that's important because uh, this bonding process where the victim uh, pings the uh, new node and is waiting for a pong can take a bit. So what you do is you finish telling him about all your nodes, your, all your attacker nodes, and when he reboots and he loses his current outgoing connections, and then you tell it, you make incoming connections and you tell him about the attacker IDs, he'll actually immediately add, him, add them to the buckets. They, they don't need to go through that long bonding process again because the victim will see those attacker nodes in his database. So he skips that long bonding process where he does ping and pong uh, if he already exists in the DB and it's within 24 hours. So that's why we tell him first before we restart it. So you make the incoming connections, that will fill all his buckets with attackers. And then he'll only make outgoing connections to the attackers. That's how you again. And lastly, you just monopolize all his incoming connections. And there you go. He only sees the attackers. And then you can do all the implications I explained in the beginning with the post attacks. All right. Some countermeasures. Um, this first vulnerability. Really weird that they had this, but uh, very simple to fix. Just don't accept any connections uh, until seeding is complete. This was adopted in 1.8, uh, which came out in February for Geth 1.8, which is the main Go Ethereum client. Um, this is important. Uh, this is a really good thing to fix because now it's, it's a little bit harder for the attacker because there's a chance that some of the seed nodes that the victim picks and inserts in the buckets are online nodes. So it means that the attacker nodes will actually have to compete with those. The attacker will have to be, either be faster or, um, or those nodes he picked are just not good when they're not online. Uh, so this makes it a bit harder. This one really, very big. Uh, the fact that the hash is public, the structuredness of the, of, the of the bucket tables. Very simple fix, just salt the hash to make the hash non-public. So back on this previous slide, or you're doing this hash. Instead of just hashing the node ID, you, the victim or any node will add just a private random salt, which will make the hash non-public, meaning the attacker can't actually guarantee to be in a specific bucket, because it's going to change how many bits are the same. Um, this wasn't adopted because 
again, Ethereum wants to preserve this Kadelia network structure. They have, they have their reasons. Uh, I didn't fully agree with, agree with it, but uh, yeah, they're, they're, they claim they're going to be using this network structure -ness, uh, in the, I don't know, soon, they said, or later on. Um, so they kept this in. I have, um, I have a question about the yeah. first countermeasure. Actually. Yeah. So the so if I'm the attacker, I'm trying to do an eclipse. Yeah. Um, it's frustrating to me because the node might pull an honest node out of its database. Yeah. So can't I thwart that just by overwhelming the database with you know you tens could, of or hundreds of thousands of puppies? Yeah, you could do that. Um, we tried doing that in the beginning, and we saw. It, it, it can get pretty. It can get pretty full, and Ethereum does this pruning of the database. So, it's it's a little it, maybe it's a little bit a little bit unclear. Um, but yeah, you could try and fill the database and make it so the seed nodes are not the honest nodes. But yeah, how big is the the bucket table? Yeah, uh, there are two hundred and fifty six buckets, and each bucket has a size of sixteen. Um, do you need to get every swap? No, because uh, the chances of any honest node getting like bucket 255 is insane. That means you have 255 bits the same with the with the with the victim, which with any node, which makes uh, be insane. It means you have a supercomputer. But yeah, so we only attack the first 16 buckets. That's what we saw on the um, on the tests. We saw that like there'd be barely any nodes in like bucket. 12. I think that we used to say so from bit 16 to 255. Yeah, it's 0 to 255, but we're just... It's put, it, it's put into the last one. What? Yeah, yeah, it would be actually... Yeah, it would be 256, then 255, two, but just for the simplicity, I've been saying 1, 2, and 3. Um, for, for, yeah. what, what I mean is, yeah. how much does the attacker need to dominate the bucket table in order I to pull up took the bucket table? Okay, I took, the, yeah, I took the first 16 buckets, uh -huh. so 16 times 16 nodes. Okay, so, yeah. so do you need to fill all those 16? Yeah, you should fill all those because if you don't, maybe an honest node comes around one day and gets into that, into that bucket. Of course, well, it won't be any day because if you've eclipsed them, then you're going to basically stop him from hearing about any new nodes as well. But let's say, there was, let's say the victim is known by the network. Maybe later on, you may have got all the buckets, but then a node in the network boots up again. Is like, oh, let me. I, I remember this node who happens to be our victim, and he might try and connect to that. So you really do want to fill all possible buckets that honest nodes can get into. So you would need to have at least like ninety-nine percent of the database. Uh, the database or the bucket tables. You just need to get the bucket table, really. Okay. So yeah. for each of the buckets that you're targeting. You need all of them, yeah. I mean, if there's one slot open yeah. Yeah. without the attacker, uh -huh. but again, it's really, it's pretty simple. I mean, let's say that, let's say, and actually our test, before these vulnerabilities were, before this vulnerability was fixed, sometimes um, what would happen is there would be some honest nodes that got inserted. I, I actually wa wasn't quick enough. It just happened on chance. Some of those honest nodes were inserted, but they weren't good nodes, or maybe they were online, but they just were overwhelmed with other connections, and they just stopped, or maybe they, they quit. And then when that guy goes off, you have the attacker ready to, to, to come in. Um, but yeah. So, yep. And this vulnerability, the fact that all node IDs in a bucket can have the same IP, simple countermeasure, just make it a one-to-one -one mapping, right? one ID per IP. Um, this wasn't fully implemented. What they did instead is make it, at most, 10 IDs in the bucket table can share the same IP. So that makes it a bit harder for the, actually a lot harder for the attacker. I mean, if he has enough money, he can still just buy IP addresses. But now you can't do it with a Mac and a digital ocean node. So. Sounds like you only need seven IP addresses now, though. Um, okay, yeah. The, I'm not sure what the calculations would be. But yeah, it's, it's not seven, though, because they do it by. Um, Distinct, you also need distinct subnets. So it's not like just any IP. I think if they do it on slash 16. Yeah, it's just um, two subnets. Yeah, two subnets. Two subnets. Per I mean, sorry, two IPs for the same subnet. Per okay, bucket, so but, it's 10, but it's 10 for the entire day. So you need two IPs. 
yeah. first subnet, and then you need first. four subnets. Uh, yeah, and then in 16. So it's still... Well, no, because it's not... Um, no, but each bucket can only have two IPs from the same. Right, right, but two buckets can have the same seven IPs saturating them. So you only need, you only need four subnets total. Okay. Two IPs at each, and then you can hit every bucket. Yeah, yeah, so it's still, again, it's still possible. You just need a little bit more money to buy the IPs from distinct subnets. But yeah, this was adopted, this countermeasure was adopted in 1.8. All right, some concluding remarks. Lessons for blockchain peer to peer networks. First one, node ID should be really hard to obtain. Basically what happened in this Eclipse attack, it's, it's a civil attack where you can make all these nodes being from the same person, and it takes a step further where you do an Eclipse attack. Um, and to compare Bitcoin, again, Bitcoin requires IP addresses in different slash 16 subnet IP address blocks. But again, Ethereum node IDs are really easy to obtain. They're just ECDSA keys. Far as we raised a bit because you can't have the same IP, but you can still just keep on churning out more nodes, more attacker nodes. Second lesson, uh, outgoing connections should be selected unpredictably. Uh, Ethan talked about this two weeks ago, but uh, pre-2015, which is when he did his Eclipse attack, Bitcoin would actually be biased towards fresher IPs, and now they choose IPs uniformly at random. Uh, even before I did the research on Ethereum, Ethereum always chose node IDs from the buckets at random. Of course, if you control the buckets with all attackers, it doesn't really matter if it's at random, if it's just attackers. But it's a good, it's a good philosophy to follow when building a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, third one. Mapping IDs to the peer table should be unpredictable. Bitcoin uses a similar thing to the countermeasure we recommend to Ethereum, where they use a local secret used in hashing, so it's hard for the attacker to know how to, which bucket he'll land into. Ethereum, though, the mapping is still public. They don't do that salt thing. So I can still mine attacker IDs and, and, and have a guarantee that I know that if there's room and I have that distinct IP, I will definitely land in that bucket. So that's still public. And lastly, just don't accept incoming connections on Reboot until you finish making all your outgoing connections, i.e. finish seeding before you start accepting connections from outside. Makes it a little bit harder for the attacker. Um, yep. In summary, remember the peer-to-peer -peer network. If you want to know some more details on the probabilities, read the paper. Any questions? Did you try this attack against any of the Ethereum boot nodes? Bootstrap nodes? Oh, it's a really good, really quick question. Um, I did actually not, I didn't do that on bootstrap nodes, but I thought about that. We didn't include it in the paper because we didn't fully know what would happen. But yes, in theory, what you could do is if you could basically, you don't even need to reboot the, um, the bootstrap nodes. What you could do is make the attacker node IDs, fill the, boost, fill the six bootstrap nodes. Um, eventually, you will fill all their buckets because maybe nodes go offline. I mean, you might not, like, it might take a week uh, for, no, for a node to, to go offline, but eventually if, you're, if the attacker's always online and you fill all those buckets, that's really bad because now when a new node joins the Ethereum network, they need to talk to those hard-coded bootstrap nodes. No one knows about it. So you're not gonna have that problem where if you're not quick enough and you don't fill all the buckets, some incoming connections might come in. There aren't gonna be any incoming connections. This is a new, this is a fresh node. No one knows about his node ID. So if you control the bootstrap nodes, their bucket tables, what will happen is they'll talk to the bootstrap nodes, they'll query, hey, can I have some peers? And the only peers they'll be getting back are attacker-controlled nodes. So yeah, if you do this on the bootstrap nodes, it's a pretty good start. Is anyone continuing this research on parity? On parity? Uh, not that enough. Yeah. We just looked at it. Yeah. Yeah. There was something in the paper about parity having a slightly different uh, protocol and therefore like some of the eclipsed uh, experiments actually wind up being connected. Um, oh, that was for the time in your time, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, no, I think you're talking about uh, version five of the RLPX, right? You're not talking about parity. Because I didn't look at, I didn't look at parity. I mean, I briefly looked at it. No, no, you weren't looking at parity, but uh, with one of the attacks yeah. uh, where you were. You were oh, the timing to... attack. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. the other implementations. Yeah. Um, it was prone to the timing attacks because there are other implementations who do different different stuff with the timing. But yeah. Yeah, they managed to they yeah. managed to keep some yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, non-attacked connections. It's true. Which were parity. Yeah. yeah. Although 
I'm sure there could be something in Perry too. I just I haven't looked at it. I look at Geth because that's the main one. So is our PFS vulnerable to the same kind of cycle poison? Uh, I don't know. They do use Kademlia. Um, I don't know the exact details. They might have some countermeasures where you can't do it all from one IP, but I, I wouldn't know. I haven't looked at that. But yeah. So what's your thought on the, the exponential chance to get in further and further buckets? The fact that they're using the structuredness of Kademlia and why it makes, why, why, why they're doing that? Or yeah, why why do you have half of all nodes planning in bucket one? So yeah, well they a smaller number of nodes. Yeah, in bucket one. so they want to preserve this network structureness where you can actually have well, with Kademlia what you can get is logarithmic time right. uh, to find nodes and, and content. Um, that's how it works in BitTorrent. But of course, what we said in the paper is that in Ethereum there's only one piece of information, which is the blockchain. So again, yeah, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not really giving them any benefits. Unless Only, they're sharding or something. Uh, which is not in yet, but yeah, that's one of the things they've said. I guess it would be related to maybe sort of with Swarm, where you'd want to refer to a specific node. That could all, yeah, that could also be, um, which you're still working on. But yeah, the only when I was looking at the code, the only use I saw of the fact that it's structured is that let's say a node knows about a node ID and doesn't know his IP, you can actually resolve and find the IP address in logarithmic time. You couldn't do that in Bitcoin because you'd have to basically ask all the nodes in the network, hey, uh, are you this node ID? If so, give me your IP address. But with Kademlia, yeah, it's structured. You'll find it really quickly for logarithmic time. Yeah. But yeah. Any other questions? Uh, uh, I tried running, I did, uh, I think I used Azure mm -hmm. for doing research with Ethereum, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, uh, it was to be trying to be very expensive. Yeah. And how does DigitalOcean look like that? Like, was it cheap? Was it they charge you extra for bandwidth? Um, I think when I was doing it, DigitalOcean just re just introduced some bandwidth costs. I think before you wouldn't get capped on that. I think now they, they have something for that. But no, I didn't have any trouble with that. I just ran, yeah, one other node to do, to do it. You ran a victim node and the Dockers? Uh, yeah, I ran, I ran, I actually ran five victims and I let them stay on for around 30 days before I started doing the attack. And then I had uh, two, uh, oh, I had one attacker there. I had two attackers, but I only used one of them um, to do the incoming connections. And then I used my Mac to do the outgoing connections, monopoli monopolizing the outgoing connections. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right.